it's a very strange feeling to hear my credentials read out in front of people that I look around and consider my leaders. I'm humbled. I cannot begin to imagine that anything I would have to share with you compares to the wealth of experience that you all have gathered. So I'm actually more looking forward to the conversation that we have after my presentation and hoping that you will be just as spirited as I've heard you've been over the last few days with lots of questions and an engaging conversation afterwards. So before I start, can I just acknowledge that I'm very impressed that the room is full. Brazil and Mexico are about to begin their game. And I, for one, feel personally put out that this presentation was set at this time because I would have been watching the game. So I just want to thank you all for being here. And uh, for those of you following on your cell phones, as soon as this is over, please tell me who's winning. That's all I need to know. <laughs> So I've been asked to speak to the theme of regional approaches to security threats, with a focus on gender mainstreaming in the context of Africa's security, as well as related challenges to the continent. Now, I'm not a gender expert. Neither am I a security expert. But I'm a woman, <laughs> and I'm a development expert. And I guess as a World Bank staffer, I have access to a lot of knowledge, data, research, and information that I hope will bring some interesting, you know, additional information to what you've been discussing already. The World Bank is also not a human rights organization. And in fact, our articles of incorporation are very clear on the issue of human rights. So very, for a very long time, we avoided dabbling into some of these areas that are considered political. But because of the overlap with the issue of gender and the ability to actually achieve economic development, we have not been able to ignore this issue for much longer. But before I go into gender and economic development, where I feel there are some very valid threats for your concern, let me begin with talking about gender mainstreaming and situations of conflict, where I think you probably have had the most discussion. Um, and in particular, Resolution 1325, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. But those that aren't, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security to affirm the important role of women, peace, and security in the prevention, sorry, of resolutions of conflicts, peace negotiations, peace building, peacekeeping, humanitarian response, and in post-conflict reconstruction. And the resolution also stresses the importance of women's equal participation and their full involvement in all efforts to maintain peace and security. It also calls on all parties that are signed up to take special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, particularly rape and other forms of sexual abuse in situations of armed conflict. So there are four main pillars in this resolution, participation, protection, prevention, relief, and recovery. And I remember when I came across this resolution, the one area that stuck out to me was participation. I felt like this was probably the most challenging component of Resolution 1325, because it's easy to enact these laws. It's not as easy to encourage people to actually participate, and not just women, but men too. It's not as easy to actually enforce participation in the laws that govern our countries. Earlier this month, the AU adopted a gender peace and security program that's going to span 2015 to 2020. And it encourages the development of effective mechanisms for gender mainstreaming and more gender participation in peace and security programs. Now, the AU has all those necessary policies, but implementation is still a major challenge. To date, just 16 African countries, including Liberia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, have adopted plans of action as part of Resolution 1325. Plans of action that are supposed to assist them in identifying priorities and resources, determining their responsibilities, and committing to action. Regional plans of action have also been developed and adopted by the Great Lakes countries, Burundi, Rwanda, and the DRC. So for commitment to translate into action, there has to be a continuous process of training, planning, monitoring, and evaluation, as well as something that sounds as simple as just setting up the indicators that allow people to monitor progress. 
Lasting peace cannot be achieved when half the population is excluded. And when Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, went to the Middle East recently, he said something very important. We can't wait for peace to begin planning for peace. Syria is still married in conflict, but the plans for peace and what happens once reconstruction efforts begin has to, be, has to start now. And that would apply to any of our countries on the continent that are still experiencing conflict. I think strong legislative response is a critical first step. And here, governments and leaders have a critical role to play in abolishing regressive laws and establishing progressive ones and implementing interventions that close the gaps between men and women. We at the World Bank are ready to support efforts in collaboration with leaders, parliaments, civil society. Let's hold each other accountable to the commitments that we make to effectively mainstream gender in peace and security. Unfortunately, there are still many discriminatory laws around the world. This is not just an African problem, it's a global problem. 128 countries still have barriers to women in basic areas such as obt obtaining an ID card, owning property, or getting a job. I personally can't stand it when people try to point fingers at one region over another. And in this situation, it really is a global problem. 28 country, countries spanning the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, and including many of ours, still have more than 10 discriminatory laws on their books. And this is where the conversation starts to get a little bit uncomfortable, because we, be, we begin to get in the, into the areas of social and cultural norms. But there is evidence that norms can change, especially as more and more evidence is developed, demonstrating the economic costs to countries. Visionary leaders are beginning to understand and have for a long time how important it is to abolish and introduce laws that empower women, not just because it is good for society, but also because it is good for development. While legislative laws are needed to bring about change, nothing can be expected to happen overnight. That said, in the last decade alone, we have found countries outlawing gender-based violence skyrocket from zero to 76. In the World Bank, while we are against the discrimination of all people, we continue to have to walk this fine line as an apolitical organization with member countries from around the world. If any of you have ever sat on a board with members of the board maybe numbering six or seven, a handful, even 12, you can imagine what it must be like for us to report to 188 member countries, our shareholders, who have representatives that work in the same building as us every day. So for an apolitical organization dabbling into some of these issues, it can get pretty tricky. Now, so what we've done, this line that we walk, is basically to focus on gathering the evidence which has now caught up with what we already understand to be morally wrong. Some gender impact on the economy data points I can share with you include the fact that women in the Middle East and Africa um, low economic participation in these regions has contributed to income losses of up to 27%. This is data that we have. And if you equalize female employment in South Asia, average income goes up by 19, could go up by 19%. Discrimination of women is bad for growth. That's hopefully obvious. And we at the World Bank feel that our role is to continue to count and collect the evidence to put in front of people that reinforces our position against discrimination of anyone, but to also highlight the missed opportunity if governments don't act now to put the right laws in place to protect women. The World Bank has been a thought leader on gender issues for a long time, and we've just released a new report last month, Hillary Clinton was at the bank to help us launch this, called Voice and Agency, that touches on some challenging issues Expanding voice and agency, and agency, agency is integral to the development agenda. And in our report, we state that when women contribute, everyone benefits. A country experiences increased productivity, which allows governments to be in a better position to provide jobs for their people. We have actually costed in this report gender discrimination to be in the range of 1.5 to 2% of GDP in several countries. The evidence there, is the, the evidence is there. Gender discrimination stunts economic growth. Given how integral growth is to job creation for our youthful continent, this is as much a threat to national security as disease outbreaks, wars, and even trade sanctions. 
Here are some more facts and figures for you. The WHO estimates that 35% of women worldwide have experienced physical or sexual partner violence. That's more than 800 million women. Conservative estimates of the resulting productivity losses range from 1.2% in GDP in countries like Brazil and Tanzania to 2% in Chile, roughly what most governments spend on primary education. Those figures do not include costs associated with long-term emotional impact and second-generation consequences. The effects of violence are felt at many different levels by the women themselves, their families, and the economy. Gender equality is a cross-cutting theme at the World Bank, and gender-based but gender -based violence is a relatively new area of strategic focus for us. Before 2012, projects that address gender-based violence were typically sub-components of larger projects or small scale, primarily financed by trust funds. But in the last year alone, we've approved 10 new projects amounting to $19 million. And going forward, we're going to scale up commitments on this front as part of a broader effort towards gender equality, which we believe is a vital prerequisite to achieving the World Bank's twin goals of reducing extreme poverty and promoting shared prosperity. The bank is also balancing new laws that protect women with legal assistance programs necessary to prosecute perpetrators and break the cycle of impunity. We are also increasingly mainstreaming gender-based violence into the design and implementation of large-scale projects, particularly in the transport, infrastructure, and urban development sectors, because gender-based violence, or GBV, spans the map of a woman's daily movement, so a broad focus is essential. I mentioned being able to track progress. This issue of data is a particularly important one because we cannot track effectively unless we have disaggregated information on what's going on. So this is another area where we're investing a significant amount of resources, collecting data on a disaggregated level. So I've talked about gender mainstreaming in the context of conflict situations, the impact of aggressive gender policies on approach, or approaches, impact on the economy, and how this particularly impacts jobs. Jobs, or the lack thereof, I think, are the new security threat to our continent. And we've heard time and time again that the key to creating jobs in Africa is to invest in productive sectors such as agriculture, where up to 70% of the population is already engaged. We know women play a vital role as agricultural producers and as agents of food and nutritional security. Yet, relative to men, they have less access to productive assets such as land and services or finance and extension. A variety of constraints impinge upon their ability to participate in collective action as members of agricultural cooperatives or water user associations, whether in centralized or decentralized governance systems, women tend to lack political voice. Gender inequalities result in less food being grown less income being earned, and higher levels of poverty and food insecurity. Agriculture in low-income developing countries is a sector with, ex with exceptionally high impact in terms of its potential to reduce poverty. Yet, for agricultural growth to fulfill this potential, gender disparities must be addressed and effectively reduced. If food security is not always at the center of sustainable agricultural development, we will not achieve economic and social development. The food price crisis is a current reminder of the crucial importance of focusing on food security as a central theme in agricultural development. This is a very real threat. Women are crucial in the translation of the products of a vibrant agriculture sector into food and nutritional security. And we have to remove all of the inequalities along the entire food chain, whether it's collecting the harvest or packaging it for stores to buy. Agriculture has an additional impact on food security through its impact on health. For example, poorly managed irrigation infrastructures may be a breeding ground for mosquitoes, and excessive use of groundwater for irrigation may compromise water sources needed by women to ensure good hygiene practices and clean food preparation without which children suffer more frequently from diarrhea and compromised growth. If women farmers in Kenya, for instance, have the same access to farm inputs, education, and experience as their male counterparts, their yields for maize, beans, and cowpeas could increase as much as 22%. This would have resulted in a one-time doubling of Kenya's GDP growth rate in 2004 from 4.3% to 8.3%. That's our data. 
More important, household productivity in agriculture and food supplies could often be increased at no extra cost by reallocating existing resources inside the household toward women. Gender mainstreaming is a globally accepted approach to achieving gender equality and will no doubt ensure effective strategies for improving on the security threats to our continent, whether it's agriculture, job security, health, climate change even. It makes women's as well as men's concerns and experiences integral to the design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of policies and programs. It promotes a comprehensive approach as it pertains to all activities in peace development and human rights and ensures that women and men can influence, participate in and benefit from these. The role of men is extremely important. Without the cooperation of men, we cannot end the violence against women. Gender ma mainstreaming must adopt a multifaceted approach, which also includes the right orientation for boys and men and encourages their participation in the crafting of new social norms. Let me share an anecdote with you. Last year, President Jim Kim and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon visited the Great Lakes region together. This was the first time the heads of these two institutions traveled for a common purpose. It was quite fitting that they were two South Korean men, where gender mainstreaming and the improvement of enabling laws for women contributed exponentially to the accelerated growth in the Asian country. One of the things that struck President Kim on that visit was the Rwandan government's commitment to fighting gender-based violence. He called the government's approach a demonstration of the best examples in women's empowerment and told President Kagame that he hoped other countries would emulate Rwanda. Peace and security must go hand in hand with development, and since this joint trip, the World Bank has identified the region as an opportunity to invest in women and young people, and, and, and an additional $1 billion is going to be invested in this region. A lot of these resources will go into education, have already started to go into education, because if girls go to and stay in school, and if they're able to learn about sexual and reproductive health, if they're able to make choices, then we can actually stop a lot of the gender-based violence and gender discrimination by empowering women and giving them opportunities. Let me end with a mention of Chibok. As a proud Nigerian, I would not be able to leave the stage without doing so. It has been my distress to live with the knowledge that a small extremist group can throw in our faces their total disregard for women. Together, you, our leaders, development experts, civil society, and ordinary citizens, must continue to stand together against the injustice that is done to women. Hashtag bring back our girls will soon be replaced by the next tre trending African tragedy. Please let's stop trending on social media for atrocities and start trending for visionary leadership and Africa's progress. My name is Edith Jibuno, and thank you for listening. <laughs>